she sits up super fast and screams in my face. She's like, yeah. <laughs> and I freaking scream back because she startled the shit out of me. And I was like, Wah! and we're both yelling at each other. And she's going, Wah! Wah! and she's deaf. So I, <laughs> so I taser. <laughs> And that's how she died. No, <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> oh, we didn't kill Bin Laden. Probably blame me for being an idiot, but and which you were, which we all were. <laughs> you have to make it to where crime doesn't pay. You have to deter crime, whether it's crime or terrorism. It's the same principle. You have to clash with supervision. You have to, or nothing will get done. Supervisors can't learn how to supervise, and you can't learn how to respect a supervisor without confrontation. It has to happen. <laughs> Not take that out. JV team for life. Revenge is an act of passion. Vengeance is an act of justice. Injuries are revenged. Crimes are avenged. Almost a century ago, big pharmaceutical companies re engineered medical school curriculum and faculty with one goal putting profit before progress. Anyone pushing back against the medical matrix they carefully crafted was threatened, silenced, censored, financially ruined, or worse. They are the problem. We are the solution. Uh, you're clear to engage. Initials Mike Two Get Alpha. You're clear to engage with weapons. You're clear to engage with weapons. It's time to talk about it. Hormone replacement therapy. I did it. Best thing I ever did. Iconics Medical offers a variety of treatments such as peptides, weight loss, comprehensive labs and hormone replacement therapy. I did HRT, and I'm telling you, it's the best thing I ever did. Muscle growth, weight loss, no depression, better sleep, high libido, um, and then there's things that you can't measure. Like, um, I started two businesses. I'm a better family man. I'm a better father. All those things tie into it. Iconics Medical offers telehealth communications. This means you can have the consultations right at your home and then have the medication delivered right to your door. Best of all, they're offering anti-hero listeners 75% off initial lab treatments. And if you continue through the process, Iconics Medical gives 10% off to all first responders and veterans. So please go to IconicsMedical.com, Iconics with an X, Medical.com, and get the labs done and see what treatment is best for you. Now we're in business. Ted, did you want to do sunglasses as well? Man, <laughs> that would make me look a lot cooler, wouldn't it? Uh, you got the mustache, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't go overboard with coolness. Yeah, man. <laughs> overboard with. Don't coolness. want to overshadow right. you guys too much. <laughs> right. Welcome back to the Anti Hero Podcast, Bart. Uh, Blart. Keep, keep, Blart. Keep that. I like it. Blart. I, I think people would like that. Yeah, probably. We'll leave it in. Welcome back to the Anti Hero Podcast, part Delta Force, part Street Cop, all podcasts. I'm Tyler, owner of Refracted Wolf Apparel. Uh, we're the dopest outsider, outsider apparel line you're going to find, especially this one, uh, Death or Glory. It's got cigar ash on it, but uh, ripped that off from uh, traditionally liberal lyrics from The Clash, but now it means something more to us. But uh, All American Outsider Apparel, use promo code ANTIHERO for 15% off your entire order. Got everything from shirts, hats, stickers, flags, everything you need, even Ranger panties. I'm Brent Tucker, owner of FRCC. We do coffee, we do cigars. Use FRCC 15 to get 15% off. And I'm going to shorten that to say thank you uh, for Free American Fishing Outfitters who sent this awesome shirt and a hat for us. It is a law enforcement, active current law enforcement uh, deputy that owns it. Go to their Instagram by the name of their company, check them out, support them. This episode is brought to you by Ghost Bed. Guys, if you're going to get any anything else, mattress bedding, please consider Ghost Bed. They're huge supporters of first responders and veterans. We're going to use them in our motorhome. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to they have a motorhome RV bed. That's it's perfect. Um if you we're on the road a lot, if you guys are on the road a lot even with work, I know a lot of guys in different units, they they are always on the road. Get yourself a ghost bed pillow. They have cooling sheets, cooling pillows, um, anything you need on the road. Please consider using ghost bed because if you use promo code antihero or you go to ghostbed.com forward slash antihero, you can save 50% off. 
five zero. That's better than anything we've ever given. Plus Almost it, sounds like a typo at first, but it's fifty five zero. <laughs> yeah. So uh, go to ghostbed.com forward slash antihero. <laughs> and also, please consider joining our Patreon. Um, we're getting flooded with messages. It's, it's, I'm not trying to sound like a dick or anything, but um, it, it's super hard for us, even with a producer that's kind of taken over our messaging. Me and Brent sometimes like to get on there and just show face, but um, it's just, it's a lot to keep up with. So if, you know, the best way to contact us and stay in contact with us is our Patreon. It's cheap, you know, $3 options, $5 options. And, uh, and we have a bunch of different message threads going. Um, Brent talks about fitness or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is ironic that we got, uh, Ted coming on the show, um, and, and full transparency. I, I talked about this on the Patreon uh, I'm even with my background. Uh, I'm no exception to the rule. I let life get in the way. I let uh, I didn't prioritize my health and fitness. And I said uh, just this last Sunday, I said enough. And having haven't had any sugar, cleaned up my diet, worked out hard since then. And uh, and we talk about it on the fitness and, and nutrition thread, just holding everyone accountable. Yeah, and. This, this whole episode is going to kind of be like just calling out our own. Um, we've got a professional in the field with us. We got Ted from Fit Responder, uh, the social media guru who happens to work out. No, I'm just kidding. He's actually, <laughs> well, you're, you're essentially, other than a business owner and former cop, would you say you're a physical trainer? Yeah. So I've been a personal trainer since I was 18 years old. Personal wow. trainer. Okay. Yeah. And you're just, you just happen to be really good at social media. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate that. I've had a few videos that that uh, seem to go kind of viral, but uh, I just throw sh shit at the wall. I can say that right on your podcast, you guys. Yeah, you throw, say sh it. I throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. And some things do well. So here's here's your new tagline: throw shit at the wall, not in your mouth. That that would be ideal. Work Avoid with it. Work with hole. it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> how how old are you now? Thirty six. Okay. How do you think, and, and there's a litany of questions that, that, that I have for you as far as, and, and everyone told it to me, I'm now 44 and yes, as you get older, but you know, I, I also believe people use that as an excuse because there's tons of people in their forties, fifties and sixties in amazing shape. Have you found 36 to be any more of a challenge than at this point in your life? Absolutely. I mean. A lot of that is self-induced because um, I really enjoyed training really hard in the gym and just it made me feel like a tough guy, like see how hard I can push myself, go to failure, hit heavy weights. Um, and I do think that some people are built differently, like some people can handle that, that abuse for longer and better. I don't think I'm one of those guys. Um, I tend to be pretty injury prone just in general, just all throughout my life. My luck on that is not the best, but my knees are not feeling good. So I really have to be smart about how I work out and, uh, pick certain exercises and avoid others. So yeah, I feel it like, you know, the aches and pains and injuries, they do add up. So I can, I can relate to my older clients, guys in their fifties who talk about their bad backs, their knees. Um, it's just another mental hurdle. You know, when you're in your early twenties, you know, you're injury free, pain free. It's, it's, you don't have to deal with that pain to push through. It's just the pain, the muscle pain, right? But now I deal with a little bit of joint pain and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it does get harder when you get older for sure. Yeah. I know, um, I'm really hard on myself and I'll, and I'm 36 years old too. And I'll be like, I'll go run two miles and I won't get it in the two mile time that I used to run at 22. Right. So, um, and I'm like, man, I used to, I used to run two miles in 13 minutes, you know, and now I'm running it and I don't want to say what I'm running it, in, but <laughs> just, just to finish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but then in, and if you look at it, how many people my age are running two miles a day? You know, I know a lot of people do run and probably a lot of people that listen to this podcast are into fitness, mm -hmm. but the average person, like when I was in, when I was in high school and I know this for a fact, a lot of the dudes that were studs are not studs anymore <laughs> oh, oh isn't that the truth <laughs> yeah 
Well, one of the first topics that I wanted to talk to you about, because man, it's at the end of the day, and feel free to, to disagree with me on this, working out is pretty straightforward. Now, as a general statement, there's better workout programs you can do. There's more effective ways to do it. But as long as you're consistent, pushing your body, your body's going to react. So to me, the biggest variable is diet. And the diet options out there are endless. And it seems like it also comes in cycles. What we thought was a good diet before isn't now. This is the whole diet thing to me seems to be a lot more confusing than, than the workout part. Yeah. I'm, so I think that's an interesting topic because a lot of people ask me about that and you'll hear statements like it's 90% nutrition, it's 10% exercise, but it depends what your goals are because let's say your goal is just sheer weight loss. That could be accomplished with diet alone. You could literally lay in bed. And if you're in an extreme calorie deficit, you're going to lose weight. If your goals are to have an aesthetic looking fit body, you're going to need some solid resistance training and good routines around that. If your goal is to do well with cardio and endurance, you're going to need to do those things. So the question has to be framed better in the sense that like, what are your goals? You know, do you have strong performance goals? Do you have strong aesthetic goals? Is it about losing the fat? Because if it is about losing the fat, a huge part of it's nutrition. It's going to be mostly nutrition, right? Um, and any consistency you see with some regular exercise is going to benefit you. But um, yes, I think some routines are better than others depending on your goals. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. In fact, I'll, I'll frame it a little better and, uh, and this will be a generalization. But most guys, especially when we, when when we hit our 30s uh, and for me in my 40s, Gaining fat was just really never a problem for me. So to me, it just mattered you know, how much I worked out, how hard I worked out, eat halfway clean, and everything just seemed to work out for me until it didn't. Huh. So I think most people in their, in, in their 30s goal is to lose the dad bod, lose the extra fat they've put on, and just be a little more muscular. Yeah. And I, well, let me, let me, Going back to genetics, right? I, I'm a, I, it, it sucks because it sounds like an excuse. Genetics, anytime people drop genetics, it's like, oh, it's because you're lazy. However, <laughs> I do believe that you are given the genetics that God gave you and your dad. That being said, I wanted, I've always wanted to ask you this, Brent. Do you consider yourself going through, probably, I know you'll say, if it isn't, the toughest military training you could ever go through? Were you, are you naturally athletic or did you just work real hard at it? Because I know the selection process isn't just physical, but it is pretty demanding. The, the answer is both. And I'll, th I'll throw a third aspect at it here in a second. But I was always athletic uh, at a young age. Um, but the things I had to be athletic at uh, in special operations, and it come, especially when it comes to selection processes, is you have to be very good at rucking, which is a whole different type of fitness. And I was not gifted at rucking. I had to, I had to train up for every single ruck I have to go on. And I know guys that did seem genetically inclined to just throw on a ruck and go forever. And they could do that. I could not. I had to train hard at rucking. Um, so, and the third aspect is that so so if that but if that was it at the end of the day just working hard enough would give everyone the same opportunity but there is a massive mental aspect to that that if you're not wired right for this job that's a type of genetics that you you can't train for and you either have it or you don't and people aren't going to like that answer but that is that is a truth when it comes to to certain jobs i i don't i've always wondered if if injuries, because I'm a, I'm the type of guy, like, kind of like what Ted was saying, like, I am so injury prone. I'm the guy that, you know, I've had two shoulder surgeries, wrist surgery. I thought I was going to have to get knee surgery for a while. And I'm like, man, am I just like that unathletic? But I put, I do push myself very hard. Um, you know, I can go 
this is gonna everybody's gonna be like, oh, but I can go knock out ten pull ups right now, no problem. I I believe I'm a firm believer that a grown man should be able to at least do five pull ups before <laughs> you. That's you, not a high bar. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in all reality, like, do you think that people get injured because they're worried about being injured, or do you think it's a mental thing? Uh, I can tell you three reasons why people get injured. One, they didn't train hard enough. And now they're asked to, now at a selection, they're asked to go really hard and their body isn't worth it, isn't used to it. Second is the opposite of that. Some guys show up in such good shape. They've been redlining their bodies for so long. When they show up, their bodies are already kind of starting to break down. And now they are injury prone. And I hate it for those guys. And the third things about injuries is luck. I was so lucky not to get injured. Now, I don't believe luck necessarily trains, uh, has as bit of, of an effect in the gym because, like Ted was saying, you at that point, you really need to cater your workouts to your, to your strength and weaknesses, although it, it can happen at any time. But when you have a ruck on your back in the mountains of West Virginia at night and you step on a rock wrong and didn't see it, that could happen to anyone. Yeah. And it did. What, Ted, were you athletic growing up? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not at all. You know what's funny is uh, I played tennis in high school. And, uh, <laughs> and why is that funny? I don't, I don't that's know. Not <laughs> that's the way you said it. Well, because people are going to be listening and going, I play tennis. <laughs> okay. So I didn't mean it to come across that way. I mean, good tennis players are very athletic in their own right. They're not muscle bound necessarily, but. Um, you know, I was actually a lazy tennis player. I, I'd hit the ball as hard as I could, <laughs> hope I could beat him that way, and I hated to run. I hated to do push-ups. My coach was a weightlifter, and he would have us do push-ups, and I would complain and whine about it. My dad would try to get me to work out, and I was just like, no, nah, I'm not having it. And what's funny is I ran into my tennis coach uh, when I was a sheriff's deputy in my early 20s, and, and he's like, Ted? And I was jacked. <laughs> and, he, and he was like, what happened? And um, yeah. yeah, you know, I started lifting weights. I'm big, you know, I'm big now, obviously. And, and uh, I'm a deputy. And he knew me as this goof off, skinny, weak, pathetic whiner. So he saw me. He's like, man, anything is possible. <laughs> yeah. uh, that was- That's a compliment and an insult. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Here is where I think genetics do play a, a massive role. And, and like you, uh, I, I was a little guy. Uh, or skinny as, and at some point as a 16 year old, 17 year old, 18 year old, you can do whatever you want to do. But if, if your goal is putting on weight, <laughs> you're not going to put on weight until your body wants you to put on weight. And I did it all. And I'm, and I don't know if you started trying to put on weight at an early age or if it wasn't until your twenties when you were able to, uh, was that, was that, was that a problem you had early or you, you weren't? trying for it at that point i wasn't really trying to do it till i was 18 but i'm naturally an ectomorph i'm i was six foot two like 160 pounds my senior year of high school and that was when i was like i need to put on muscle like i'm so weak and pathetic uh and i definitely had a hard time gaining um but the, i've experienced both ends of the spectrum because in my early 20s after i had gained a lot of muscle I kept eating and eating and, you know, dirty bulking and I ended up getting way too fat. So I've had both issues, you know, the difficulty of putting on mass and, you know, being 40 pounds overweight and needing to lose that. Yeah. Well, I'm in the same way. I was, I'm, I'm naturally skinny fat. But <laughs> I wish that high school, even back when I graduated, like, so I was in high school, like 2002 to 2006, they had, um, they had options to not do pull-ups you could do flex arm hang right you could not be embarrassed and you know i really wish i would have learned these lessons in high school and not in basic training in the army ready to go to war because that was harsh i had i went to do my assessment pt tests like first day in a basic training and you know i had done 50 push-ups not 50 army standard push-ups and they were yeah. like yeah, my drill sergeant was like zero, 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 zero. And he's like, You're 19 years old, joining the army. You should be able to do more than 10 push ups, Hoover. And like, oh, dude, <laughs> so embarrassing. And that, I, if I had better standards enforced on me at a younger age, I would have been able, a little bit more prone to do better at 
the PT test. Yeah, and people aren't going to like this, and that's okay. Then, then you didn't do what what we've done, which is be prepared in a profession to fight bad guys. So when you you were talking about uh, you know not wanting to be embarrassed in front of everyone, maybe that's a good thing in high school, maybe not, but uh, and that's a whole other discussion. But being embarrassed for your physical shape and standards in the military and law enforcement, you absolutely should be embarrassed in front of everyone if you cannot meet the standards. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. With you there. That's all. Yeah, I agree. Um, and one thing about you, Ted, that I fucking love is that as a business owner, you know, most people are pretty PC. Like, uh, <laughs> just, you're a business owner, right? If you own a business, you, you want customers, you don't want bad reviews, you can't have people saying this guy's a dick, but you are not PC at all. You're one of the only cops that own a business that I know of that'll go out there and say, when, when there's a question about a use of force, you know, your go-to like a real cop is, well, um, he shouldn't have been resisting arrest and that wouldn't have happened to him. <laughs> yeah, I could be way worse though. I, it, believe it or not, I restrain myself every day. I mean, there's posts that I'll make and my wife will go, are you serious? You need to delete that. And I'll be like, really? And I'll delete it. Or, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been like that. And, and at work, I've gotten in trouble for my mouth talking to people. Um, I don't have the best filter sometimes. Are you telling me that mustache is not a filter? <laughs> <laughs> It it's actually catches too many debris. So, you know, if you, this mustache is so inconvenient. Have you ever had a mustache this thick? Because if you try to blow your nose, it, the boogers get in it. You try to drink coffee, the coffee, the food. You try to kiss your wife. She flinches. I mean, <laughs> I, I'll admit this on your podcast. I keep the mustache for business because I put out ads and people will say, you know, I only stopped to and pause and listen to what you said because that ridiculous mustache. I'm like, who is this guy? Uh, so I know it, it helps spread the word of the responder. Um, so I keep the stash. And my wife does actually like it, believe it or not. Oh, I, we, we talked about it a little bit of, before the episode, but I, I told you, at, uh, us at FRCC have been following you on Instagram for a long time. So uh, before you came on this podcast, I, I knew exactly who you were. And I knew exactly the, the, the way you deliver the message, which, which I love. And I told you my, one of my favorite posts from you was this, this trick you do for, for abs. You want to share with the antihero listeners your trick? Oh, sure. So <laughs> in the video, you know, I'm lifting my shirt, I'm showing my abs. I'm like, here's this really cool trick with your hand so that it makes your abs appear to look sharper so you can have a six pack, right? And what you do with this hand, is you make sure that you stop putting food in your mouth with it so often. That's the cool trick, all right? Uh, I, it's definitely oversimplified. And, and honestly, I'm being genuine because getting in great shape is much more than don't eat as much food. But let's face it, that is a huge part of not being fat. Uh, and so, peer but, pressure so, and bullying also. <laughs> that help. I think it can be helpful. So some people will see my posts and they're like, man, you're, you're fat shaming. But like when I was fat, if I saw a post that's like, hey, dad bods are lame or you shouldn't be a fat cop or anything like that, I would have been like, damn it, they're right. I wouldn't have been like, well, that's offensive and they're mean. I would have been like, dang it. I, that's true. So yeah, your got, before and after picture, uh, your before picture still looks better than me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, hey, to be, to be real, I don't have pictures of me at my worst. Unfortunately, I was so embarrassed when I was at my fattest, I uh, hated pictures like my double chin and everything. Uh, yeah. So I wish I did. Like, so anyone out there, if you're out of shape and you're embarrassed of those pictures, we'll take some so you can have a great before and after and show people what you did. Uh, speaking of body shaming, uh, <laughs> I saw one of the, in the comments, I, when I see videos, like I'm about to explain the first place I go is the comments and it's this young lady talking about these other social media influencers and they're grossly fat. They're 300 pounds and, and they're all talking about how big is beautiful and <laughs> big it, you know, isn't a bad thing. And then she stops the video and she goes, and she's dead. Mm, and she does that, that for like four or five videos <clears throat> of all these 
super obese influencers that are proud of their fatness and they're all dead. And the comment section of people roasting her uh, are baffle me because that's the message that you need to hear. If you're grossly obese, you are going to die sooner than later. And it's not a good thing. It's not a beautiful thing. I don't know why people have a hard time hearing that. Uh, people never like to hear about how they're failing. No one likes to admit that, right? Everybody has so many defense mechanisms to protect themselves because it's painful to actually realize, believe, and admit to the fact that you are responsible for your personal failures. Uh, and so the first step to make it easy is not even recognizing it as a failure at all, right? <laughs> that is that is the easy answer. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, okay, so we got in on this podcast right now, we've got a current cop, We've got a former cop and we've got somebody that supports cops, but has actually never been a cop. So what is your take, Brent, on fat cops? Don't hold back. As this, as a citizen, you, you know, you call them, you rely on them. What's your take on cops that when we know what they look like, they are overflowing in like 300 pounds here. It's, it's the same, um, opinion I have in the military. And it really, and it does, I don't care if you're on a SWAT team or sitting there in the courtroom doing nothing and you never have to chase down a bad guy. At the end of the day, it isn't even necessarily about the job that you do in that uniform. If you are going to put on a uniform that represents this country or represents your community, you better not look like a fat slob on it. That's, that's my opinion. I'm going to label that Delta Force Fat Shames Cops. No, oh, please do. <laughs> that would be. What's your take, Ted? I mean, you bit, you had skin in the game, uh, you know, while you were in. I know, granted, you're a little hard on yourself, but I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking like overweight, I'm talking like the ones that even society and the community look at and they're like, Jesus, man. <laughs> God. Yeah, it's, it's an undeniable fact that all of us are going to make judgments about people initially based on surface level characteristics. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone can see uh, an overweight law enforcement officer. And as you said, specifically someone who is quite obese, I don't know if there's anybody who's going to say, Hey, that person is very capable of their job and all of the potential duties and uh, their capabilities to responding to emergencies. I don't know if, uh, you know, is anyone going to look at that person and say, yeah, I feel very confident they're going to be capable. And not to say you can't do your job. There's a lot of very fat cops who can do aspects of their job well, but this is the analogy I like. Okay. So if you have an airline pilot who can do most things really well, they can do standard commercial flights well, but what if they were to tell you, Hey, when it comes to like emergency landing procedures, I've completely neglected those. I, I don't know anything <laughs> about it. I, I I can't do them or, or yeah, Hey, I think I could do them, but you know, I haven't studied them or learned anything about it. And I haven't done the standard training that I should, uh, for decades. That's my analogy because maybe they could do the day to day stuff. All right. But like, do you really want that person to have your back when it counts? Yeah. I, I think that's a great aspect uh, of how to look on it. Um, I've been there. I've been there. Uh, I, and someone else was on one side of a fence uh, having a, a physical encounter. And I remember looking at my backup and there's, he's on the other side of the fence and he was calling for bolt cutters because he was a big boy. And wow. I mean, granted, this was a 12 foot tall chain link fence, but anybody with gear should have been able to climb that and jump. I'm not saying like Olympic fucking jump it, but get over it in 30 seconds. And right. they were like, we need bolt cutters. And they were so and then other people were showing up and the, the regular size dudes were getting over and they finally got both and they cut each link and pulled it down. <laughs> That's so what irritates it the, the, the most to me. If you don't have enough personal pride to do it for yourself, for the love of God, do it for your teammates, do it for the people that you have to back up, do it Amen. for the guys to the left and right of you. And I'll tell you when I was overseas in combat and when I was tired, and didn't feel like working out. I didn't work out for myself. 
I worked out for my teammates, and I don't understand that mentality. I can't. Oh, this was going to tell you when you're talking about judging a book by its cover or uh, or by appearance. Um, I just did a commencement speech at Georgetown University for their ROTC program. And one of the things I told them, I said, this is, I hate this saying more than anything. And it's don't judge a book by its cover. It's the most ridiculous saying that we've ever bought into. If I went to books a million and there's a special forces dude with a big beard and kit looking like he's in combat and I buy it, and I open the book, and, and the title of the book is Masters of Chaos. And I start reading the book, and it's a romance novel. I'm going to be pretty pissed. <laughs> yeah. Of course you judge a book by its cover. That's The book industry does books by its cover because of what's inside <laughs> it. Who made up that saying? Y- y- y'all's analogies are on point today. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, tying in current events. This is a loaded current event, so you could take a lot, but we're talking about fitness. Seattle Police Department reaches lowest staffing level in 30 years. More than 700 police officers left Seattle Police Department in the past five years. That's a whole other topic. Uh, the department is now at its lowest staffing level in 30 years. Now, I was about to say before I remembered this, I remember even when I joined eight years ago, uh, physical fitness was a huge uh, proponent in deciding whether or not you could be a candidate in law enforcement. I know for a fact they are lowering standards by the year, by the year, by the year. Obstacle courses are being torn down. New ones are being built to accommodate the people that can't get it. (laughs) But Ted, what's your take on, you know, uh, like both of y'all's take on lowering standards for numbers? Yeah, because they, I mean, in, in all reality, they have to fill them. We can't not have cops. It's a culture thing, in my opinion. Go ahead, Ted. Yeah, it's a, the wrong solution to a problem. I mean, well, it's not even a solution. It's just a temporary way to help recruitment. Um, so obviously, I think we all know the ways that they can improve re- recruitment. You got to make the career more attractive. You got to have more support in the media for law enforcement. Um, you have to support our officers and all the good stuff that admin can do. And you, know, you got to make the career more attractive. It was attractive. I mean, when I applied in 2010, there was like, I want to say a little over a thousand applicants. And I want to say they were hiring around 10. And then now I constantly hear from cops all over the country that they can't even fill the amount of spots they need to fill. So What's the answer to that, right? They're trying to encourage people to apply who could not otherwise pass standards that we all know are easy. I mean, has anyone heard of a, a standard, a testing, uh, a physical testing for police departments uh, that, that's actually very difficult? I mean, not really. Uh, so no, it's terrible because from my perspective, I've talked to a ton of cops all over the country who have had real issues in the field. They could not catch up in a foot pursuit. They could not do well in a fight. They didn't get to back up their partner. Like these are real life failures that I hear about all the time. Uh, that's affecting people. It's affecting their safety and affecting the safety of others, their partners and citizens. So obviously uh, making the standards lower is not, is not going to do anything positive. It's terrible. You're gonna, I'm going to get on my soapbox now. This, this this topic, I get very emotional about, if you will. So to even address that question, it drives me crazy because the, the headquarters looks at that and they're like, hey, we have, we have a recruiting issue. No, you don't. You have a retention issue right mm-hmm. off the bat. And that's, and that's your problem. You cause all those people to leave. And so now... The, the problem that you caused is now a recruiting issue, but it, really it's a retention issue right off the bat. Besides that, um, you, recruit for the, you recruit in the pool for the people you want. So now you're trying to fill those numbers. And if you want to try to fill numbers for people who are looking for the easiest way to get into a profession, then you'll fill those numbers, but not with the people you want. And oh, by the way, you know who your biggest recruiters are? The people that are wearing the uniform. Yep. 
The people mm-hmm. are wearing the uniform that tell their friends, this is a great job. This is a great department to work for. You were doing great things, but the few that are staying in you know, aren't, aren't saying that because it's not true. So I, I kick it back. I don't even think it's a recruiting problem. It's a retention problem, and that's on hire. Well, speaking of retaining, going back to what you said, Ted, you're absolutely right. The, the model of a police academy um, is an initial fitness test, right? You have to initially be able to, I mean, it's stupid low. It always has been. The amount of push-ups, I don't think there's pull-ups. I don't think there ever has been. Sit-ups and a run, you know, just to initially get into the academy. Um, never been that large, right? Anybody could do it. The academy, they're still out there paramilitary academies that then take six months to teach you how to stay in shape, how to be in shape, um, how to end the academy. And you get to see your progress and you're like, Whoa, dude, I I did all this in six months, you know, then hopefully you retain that all and you make that part of your life. But the biggest thing I've noticed is that there's no, uh, once you become a cop, once you graduate academy, there's no, uh, reason to stay other than the ones we talked about, the ones that are very important. If you don't care that you can't respond, um, there's no like, Hey, you got three months to pass this test or you're going on desk duty. You know what I'm saying? There's just no like mandatory PT requirements that you do annually. I, I hate to go to Google just real quick without doing a, a better search on this, but i let me tell you what I, I got right off the bat for that. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Physical Abilities Test. So I'm, a sh- I'm guessing this is what you have to do just, just to get in. One, exit a vehicle and open a trunk. That is, that is actually on there. Yeah, I know what this process <laughs> is. Yeah. All right. Running 220 yards. Completing an obstacle course. Now that's subjective depending on how hard the obstacle course is. It's like uh, you know, the the fucking things that you run through with your feet in football. The right. <laughs> it's it's something like that. It ain't hard. Dragging a hundred and fifty pound dummy. Again, they don't say how far, so that could be subjective. But if it's short, it shouldn't be a big deal for anyone breathing. Well, first of all, who weighs 150 pounds? And th- that's another <laughs> problem. Right. Yeah. Um Run 220 yards again. Dry fire a weapon six times with each hand and placing items in a trunk. I've, I feel like my nine-year-old could do this. Yeah, that is, the, that is what a lot of agencies use as like an annual, like uh, you're in shape, but do they tell you the time limit? They don't. I wish they gave... Uh, distances for the 150 pound and the time limit. I think it's like 20 meters, but I mean, you look at it in all reality, the people that struggle other than out of, out of shape people, females struggle with that one. Oh, here we go. Had to go for 150 pound dummy, a hundred feet. So not even a hundred yards, a hundred feet, three first downs. <laughs> Could you imagine if the dummy weighed 220 pounds? Oh, with gosh. gear, add some gear onto it. Yeah, right. I, 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 that's a question I'd like. I'd honestly like to have an answer to. <clears throat> Who came up with 150 pounds? Um, and when it says run 220 yards, when it goes into the the task explanations, it, it doesn't have a um a time a time limit on that. Ted, did your form? Are you, do you feel comfortable telling us where you used to work? Absolutely. Uh, Ventura County Sheriff's Office in Southern California. I was there for 11 years. How, how was it? How did you like working for him? I think it's a fantastic department. Um, I really had a great time. Obviously, no matter where you work, you're going to deal with some idiots within and some people you don't quite get along with or whatever. But overall, I think it's a very good department. It's, it's professionally ran. Um, they have a lot of great assignments. Uh, there's there are good people in leadership. Um, like I said, obviously sometimes you get stuck with a partner who's not. Do you feel like, uh, because some people are going to have a, a, a preconceived notion of Southern California. Is there anything you felt like that you had to deal with that was specific to Southern California and that area that was frustrating or even a positive is whether it be working, having to deal with illegals, 
turning a blind eye towards no. illegals, liberal policies, whatever you know people think of when they think of Southern California. You know, I'm sure there's some things about California that aren't the same in other states, such as, yeah, they are. Well, there is no enforcement of uh, citizenship issues. I mean, if you come across somebody who you know is illegal, I mean, nothing is done. I don't know if anything's done in other states, but that's not even something we would care about or look at. Um, you know, marijuana is pretty much no, a, a big nothing there. Um Personally, I, I'm fine with marijuana uh, if if we're okay with alcohol. But that's another note. Yeah, um, I, that's a whole other topic. That's yeah. a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, and I agree with that. From, from a guy who doesn't smoke marijuana, I agree with that statement. Yeah, we could talk about that. But um, no, as far as like liberal issues, let's say, I mean, Ventura County is actually pretty conservative. I would say most people do support cops there. We didn't see the same problems that you would see in LA. I mean, the one thing that drives me nuts about some of the policies out that way is on homelessness and yeah. um what you guys know this homeless people in general cause problems and you need some type of enforcement but you look at like la and you look at the surrounding areas there and it's just being overrun it's disgusting what the homeless people are doing out there and how nothing's being done about it that's one thing that just personally kind of drives me nuts but no nah, i i didn't see any big problems with being a law enforcement officer in California, at least where I work specifically. I can tell Brent wants to shit on homeless people. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Homelessness is only a problem in LA until the Chinese president comes in and then they can figure that out their San homeless Francisco. problem. Was that San Francisco? Yeah, Dang it. Dang yeah. it. I mean, it, homelessness is, it is, it's a problem in central Florida as well. And I mean, it's not nearly as bad as, as California. I don't think maybe Seattle and Portland are probably pretty bad, but I mean, just the homeless, homeless people. I watched the County of Volusia, uh, attempt a couple years ago. They spent what, millions of dollars, if not billions to build a homeless shelter to help Daytona, uh, essentially get rid of the, the homeless problem there. And guess what? Nobody wanted to go because they don't allow drugs and alcohol. And the homeless <laughs> people, literally, they love that life. They love that life of no responsibilities. Yeah. Um, and and the way you combat that as a society, we're not even talking law enforcement, as a society, is people got to be okay with not giving them money at the intersection. It starts there with their little sign, and you're sitting there watching the Karen in front of you give them five bucks, and you're like, until he's on your on your road, Karen, and then you're calling us. <laughs> yeah, Karen, you are buying that guy heroin. Do you realize? Yeah. That, you know, you know. I feel like we've been hard on the homeless, so I'm going to say one thing positive about them, and 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 my history of seeing homeless people. They're not fat. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, oh them. my god, they're you're so them. right. The <laughs> fucking crackhead homeless people that we do. Oh my god, that I'm, sounds really. I bad. don't know if I've ever seen a fat homeless person. Dude, they got. Ass uh, all they, they do is drugs and eat Cheetos and drink Slurpees and they have the fucking dick root, the V and six abs, <laughs> oh like six pack abs. Like, yeah, they sure. exist. The fat ones exist, but they are. Right, for sure. <laughs> know what the best thing to do to a homeless person is, is oh no, you see it, you're walking and you see them coming up. They go, oh, and they're about that. And you go, Hey man, you have a dollar. And they <laughs> fucking, they oh. hate that. Hey man, you got a dollar. And then you're like, well, you were going to ask me for a dollar. I can ask you for a dollar. <laughs> I've, I feel like what's really wrecked uh, homeless people and beggars is tap to pay. Who carries cash on them anyway? Like people ask me all the time and I don't have a dollar to give you. Yeah. Well, I don't now, even have They're going to start carrying. Hey, you can, oh, yeah. it's okay. You can just get <laughs> here. Give me five bucks. <laughs> Swipe. Swipe your card right here. <laughs> um, so Ted, you offer um, online services, correct? Yes. Coaching. Mm -hmm. so you don't have to. You live in, uh, you are headquartered in Utah, correct? That's where I live, yeah. Okay. So I'm not trying to plug you shamelessly, but I'm, tell, I'm saying this 100%. If I ever hired a physical trainer, it would be someone like you. I ha like we always talk about this. I have to have cops tell me, you know, he's legit like that, that, that roofer is, is a good dude. Right. And so I don't, I, 
I wouldn't trust that a physical trainer would know my job and know what I have to go through and know what I can and can't do. Like, I need you here every day at four o'clock. Okay. I can't, I can't do something every day because my, my, I work every other day, flip rotations and I work from 3 PM to 3 AM. Right. And so I feel like, especially with your personality too, you're a real street cop. You came from the, you know, being a street cop. So you understand all these things. And I feel like you would benefit a lot of cops that are on the edge of being afraid to go, I don't know everything, even though I feel like I know everything because I'm supposed to know everything because society makes me know everything. And you got to fake it till you make it sometimes when you talk to people. I, if I was teetering to ask for advice, what would you say to me? Well, yeah, there's a couple things. One thing that I like to remind people of is that all professional athletes have a coach. So we shouldn't base it on, well, hey, you know, I know enough. Like, first of all, be humble. There might be some things you could learn. And there might be some quick tricks and tips that could really improve your systems. And you might need a total overhaul. Um, but professional athletes have coaches. Uh, accountability matters a lot. So I use this analogy too. like imagine you're on FTO and you're getting trained and they go, hey, you know what? No one's going to watch what you're doing. No one's going to be there to answer questions. Uh, you could do some Google searches. But like what calls you get involved in, how well you do, when you show up, that's completely up to you. No one's looking over your back. Uh, nobody would do well. But the fact is when you have someone like an FTO in this example or a physical trainer or a fitness coach, if they're like, I'm watching you, I see what your weaknesses are, let's work on this. I want to see you improve on XYZ. Let's see you show up tomorrow and see how much you've improved on this. We do better, you know? So like if you're struggling uh, consider getting a fitness coach because uh, I have had a fitness coach for probably 50% of my life over the last 10 years. And uh, they're, even the bad ones were worth it because I learned something. And I, I feel like there's nothing much better than, than investing in your own physical fitness and health. There's not many things that are more worthwhile. But Tyler, I appreciate your comments and give me a shout out. And, and I'll tell you that one of the things that first inspired me to do this and to start Fit Responder is that I had a fitness coach when I was on patrol and he had me on like this bodybuilder routine where I was eating small meals every two hours and doing like two hour workouts. And there was this one day where I was on a traffic collision and I was uh, directing traffic and I was out there for like six hours. So I told my coach, I'm like, hey, I missed, you know, meal four and five. Sorry about that. And, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do my workout today. And, and he replied, you must not want this bad enough. So I'm like, wow, this guy does not understand my job. You know, he doesn't understand me. And that inspired me. I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if there was a fitness coach who understood the demands, the lifestyle, the stress, and all of the crap we deal with as first responders? Um, so not long after that, I started offering my services. Nice. That that is a legit answer. Yeah, I, I mean, like that. You know, and what what I do like about you know what you're doing is at the end of the day they're being prepared for their job. They're being prepared for life by by being physically fit. And uh, well, s speaking of being prepared, Jace Medical. Uh, fun fact: in 2024, they are expecting 24 named hurricanes to come in from the coast. Six of those uh, are expected to be named major hurricanes over 111 miles an hour. So us on the East Coast, that, that says something to us. I just had family in the Midwest go through tornadoes, so it's not even limited to, uh, to hurricanes. So being prepared, there is something you can do to ensure that you and your loved ones have medications on hand when needed. It's a solution thousands of people already have discovered. So start stocking up now. The Jace case is a personalized emergency medi medication kit that contains essential antibiotics and medications that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a Jace case is to fill out a simple online form. Doctors created, doctors recommended. Jace Medical provides customizability for your Jace case with dozens of add-on medications. They recently added ivermectin as a new option within the Jace case. Don't be caught unprepared. 
Everyone should be empowered for themselves, to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. Jace handles everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy, medication delivery, and ongoing consultation and care. For as low as $270, you can get more than $700 worth of physician evaluation and medicine. Antibiotics saved my life in combat, so be prepared. Go to jace.com, enter anti-hero at checkout, and get a, to get a discount out of your order. That's promo code anti-hero at jace, J-A-S-E dot com. Yeah, very important because, you know, when those things hit, the panhandle got hit. I mean, other than other counties coming in to assist, there ain't nothing there, you, you know, and it's, it's a personalized bag with all the medication you're going to need. And, you know, it, it is run through by a doctor. Like when you put in your order, a doctor reviews it. You have to answer questions, what you're allergic to, you know. When medical emergency services aren't up and running, the smallest cut can turn into a major problem once it gets infected. And for an antibiotic, it'll take care of it real quick. Or it could go south real quick. So it's just too easy to have on hand. And people just aren't prepared, and there's no reason for it. So there's there's one way to be prepared, as well as physically. What's up, everybody? Want to give a quick shout out to Zero Nine Holsters, ruggedized equipment, proudly made in America for cops by cops. This Ohio-based company uses injected molded plastics and Codex Thermoform material, which makes it super easy and convenient to clean all of the bodily fluids you come into contact with on your shift. They got radio holsters, BWC holsters, pistol and AR. Mag holsters, pepper spray, handcuffs, and flashlight holsters, and various canine equipment holsters. The ruggedized case allows for a quick draw of your equipment without the fumbling around when returning to a shapeless holster. Head over to 09holsters.com and use promo code 09ANTIHERO10 for 10% off your order. That's 09ANTIHERO10 for 10% off your order. Officer Privacy, ran by current and retired law enforcement officers. This is available to everyone. Cops, teachers, lawyers, realtors, influencers, anyone that doesn't want their private information on the internet. There's a connection between your name and your address that can be found by anybody with access to the internet. There are people out there that want to harm you and your family. It's the sad truth. Don't wait until it's too late. What good is a pool without a privacy fence? This is an essential purchase for you and your family's safety. Go to officerprivacy.com forward slash anti to sign up and get the authentic feeling of security that you deserve. I want to go back to uh, talking about nutrition. And I talked uh, a little bit about it as far as it, it seems like it'd be science, right? Like we, I remember the 1980s when nobody wanted to eat fats because fat makes you fat. And, you know, now that's free. (laughs) That's right. There's, you know, and whether this is a fallacy or not eating every two hours and smaller meals more often speeds up, um, you know, is better for you. But I've also read articles that say that's not true. Just eat three regular meals a day. There's there's just the information is everywhere on nutrition. Where do you stand on it, whether it be like a carnivore diet, whether it be an Atkins diet? What, what do you talk about when it comes to nutrition and food? Yeah, that's a good question. I think anytime you're looking at something that is leaning toward an extreme, we ought to be a little bit cautious. Um, you know, and that tends to be the, the trend with a lot of these fad diets is they're going to be excluding and very negative about certain food groups and kind of like overhyping others. Um, So believe it or not, I don't think the optimal diet is a bunch of uh, bacon and cheese, like AKA keto, let's say. Uh, um, But I tend to look at nutrition really practically. I think there's general principles that I like to follow that I think are common sense, like emphasizing whole foods, minimalizing, uh, or excuse me, minimizing processed foods, like avoiding added sugars, um, avoiding ingredient lists that uh, go on and on and on with a lot of things you don't understand. Like these are common sense principles, right? But I think the best approach to nutrition is when you can apply like kind of those common sense principles, eating healthy, whole foods, um, staying within a, a calorie range that's appropriate to you, um, you know, minimizing the junk. And then beyond that, it's going to be what you can stay consistent with. Now, I don't think most people can stay consistent eating meals every two hours. And I don't think that's 
really beneficial for most intensive purposes. Uh, so to me, when I approach it with a client, let's say, and even my own life, I want to learn more about them. What are foods you like? What are foods you dislike? What are your current habits? You know, when are you hungry? When do you like to eat? When is it convenient for you? And kind of like making adjustments and tweaks to take that as a framework, you know, and then just kind of like refine it. I don't know if that makes sense, but again, I guess just to recap, like whole food, you know, lean meats and veggies and fruits are good. Minimizing food, minimizing added sugars, minimizing uh, ingredient lists, because the more things they throw in them, the more processed it is, it seems to be worse overall. Uh, and then other than that, you know, a good amount of protein and uh, just doing what you can stay consistent with. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, because I mean, it's it when you say like when you ask people these questions, it's true. What are you? What are you not going to eat? Because I'm not going to waste my time telling you to eat something that I know you're not going to eat. Is it going to be that bad to where you're going to quit? Because you just absolutely hate this, right? right. So, um, what's your take on? You brought it up, uh, fad diets. What's your take on the carnivore diet? Which is I only ask this diet specifically because it's a very very popular diet right now. And people are seeing results. And I don't know if seeing results necessarily means that is good for you. But let's just say if someone can is happy doing it and it's sustainable and they're able to go to the functions and do the thing and stay on carnivore, uh, what's your take on that? I would urge anybody to do regular checkups. And, and I, take, I do a full blood panel every six months. So monitor that. Because we actually, as individuals, react differently to diets. Um, the carnivore diet, I, I would prefer it over some others, right? Like, I definitely pre would prefer it over, like, as you said, the 80s low-fat diet. Um, I prefer it over just, like, keto, for example. Um, and, I mean, I love meat. I love steak. <laughs> I love eggs. Um, some of, That's some of the most regular food I eat is, is whole, whole eggs and... and red meat. And, uh, but again, like anytime you're approaching an extreme, the things I worry about is overdoing it. And I do think overdoing saturated fat could be an issue. There's a ton of research on it. Sure. Maybe it could all be wrong and maybe it's all potentially a conspiracy theory and it's all funded by pharmaceutical companies. But <laughs> um, I, think, I think we could play it safe and say, hey, we shouldn't overemphasize any one thing. Um, so I am a bit, a little skeptical about that. Um, and I, and I worry about the sustainability of it. Like you're telling me you're not going to go get bread. Like you don't want to eat rice anymore. You don't want to eat oatmeal. I don't know. It, so I think you can trend toward absurdity when you, uh, yeah. demonize a lot of different food groups with whatever diet you're doing. I got three specific questions for you when it comes to nutrition. Um, What's your, and I, I feel like I already know the answer because you've, you, you've given it, but your take on energy drinks, because almost everyone that has a, 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 a job that takes a lot out of them physically or they don't get enough sleep, it's just, it seems to be just a norm in people's lives that they are just going to have an energy drink every day. Yeah. And, um, and, they, and they can be zero sugar and they can be zero calories, but their ingredient label is still 80 things long. Uh, what's what's your take on energy drinks? And I don't know what any of those 80 things are. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there aren't really any long-term studies, right, that exist on the effects of consuming energy drinks and the ingredients within on a regular basis for years on end. Yeah. So we got to tread lightly here. But yeah, I think our intuition is correct. And as you're alluding to that, like, uh, it, you know, a high amount of caffeine and its effects on cortisol levels and stress and anxiety and all of the mysterious ingredients that are in energy drinks, I definitely think we should use them sparingly. And what's, what's sad about first responders is, yes, we work long hours. Our sleep can be deprived. You might need to be up at 2 in the morning, alert. So it's tempting to want to do energy drinks. You know, hey, they make you feel good and you're hyped up. It's kind of like a legal form of mild meth, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we should limit it. I mean... So I tend to recommend we consume less than 400 milligrams of caffeine in a day. And a lot of people are way over that. And a lot of people are totally unaware of how much caffeine they're consuming. 
Yeah. Uh, and, you know, one thing I like to say is if our grandpas fought the Nazis in World War II on cold coffee or nothing, you can do night shift and not rely on a bang energy drink. So um, what I take from that is you just you end up just telling people it's, it may not be the best thing for you, and you just push everyone to FRCC, and I appreciate that. <laughs> there you go. The second question I have that I get a lot of like weird answers for, and some people get very adamant about it, and it seems like a simple question, but milk. Is milk good for you, bad for you, <laughs> something you – I know that sounds I know that sounds weird. A uh, question, but, <laughs> but there is some people very adamant about milk not being good for you. The way that the pasteurizing process, and I, I drink a lot of milk. Any, any particular insight, or do you drink milk? I love milk personally. Um, I do. I'm lactose, right? So I get uh, milk that has lactase added, which is called lactose free milk. Um, Again, like if you enjoy milk and you want to have a, a glass or two a day and you don't notice any issues with your regular checkups and you don't have any bloating or, you know, gastrointestinal issues, I'm, I'm all for it. I I'll mean, milk, it. we've been consuming milk as humans for quite a while now. Yeah. Um, and, and so, again, these are my general principles. I'm a little weary if we're going to like totally demonize, um, especially whole food sources. Uh, and if we're using it in moderation, like you're not drinking a gallon a day, yeah. uh, I think it's fine. I got the answer I wanted, so we'll leave it there. All right. Um, <laughs> drink milk. <laughs> yeah. And lastly, vitamins. Are, is extra vitamins good for you? Do you get all the vitamins you need just out of eating healthy? What do you do for vitamins? And I'll even add protein supplements onto this. Okay, so for vitamins, I have like a common sense approach. I take a multivitamin every day. I take a fish oil. Um, I do take vitamin D because on some uh, some labs I've done, it's been low at times. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I look at it as like might as well. If I spend thirty dollars a month on some vitamins, at worst, I'm pissing them out. Uh, <laughs> so I think it, you know, it's something you do just to be safe. You check that box. Protein supplements, I don't think there's any like extra benefit to them, uh, more so than like natural protein sources. I mean, if you took two identical people in every way, shape, and form, their lifestyles, their genetics, everything's the same. One has 30 grams of protein from whey, the other has 30 grams of protein from chicken for a particular meal. I don't think there'd be any difference between them in the end. But I do like protein powder because there's a lot of different flavors, it tastes good. I mix it in shakes, oatmeal. Uh, so sure. Going to a little bit of current events, just a little bit. It happened in October last year, and I don't even know where the fuck it happened. So this is going to be, I'm going to uh, be able to, if we do this as a clip, play the actual clip. But it's kind of just in in general in law enforcement. Uh, this clip shows somebody being apprehended, being handcuffed, they take off running. Right, That happens to us all the time. Sometimes it happens to you once a shift. Um, the foot pursuit happens, and with the taser, you're allowed when people, m most agencies, when people resist arrest, that's called actively resisting. They're not just sitting there. Because technically passive resisting, you're just sitting there. You're not moving, so you need to move. You're making a point. You're protesting. I can't just pop taser prongs in you, right? <laughs> if you're actively resisting, that means that you're running from me or fighting my control. A taser is allowed to be used in that. Now, what's your, what, Brent, what's your take on... A guy running, right? He's he's taking off running. He's on concrete. This happens all the time. He gets tased in the back by law enforcement. And we joke, they they typically scorpion, where they hit, their upper body hits and their legs keep going up like a scorpion tail. Right. Uh, this particular instance, he fell and he hit his head, what I believe to be a curb, and he died. And everybody's naturally like, why did you tase him? You should have known better. I have the same answer to that that I always have with these type of police encounters, whether it be people fighting police, running for police. Don't run from police, and you'll never have to worry about this. Yeah. Done. That's my statement. The, the tasers is kind of like use at your own risk. There's so many parameters that you have to know. So when you're in a situation, you have to look at all the surroundings. Is he near water? Is he carrying something flammable? Is he high up? Is he next to a curb? Is he on concrete? Is he, did I already say the bicycle thing? No. That's, that's a, is he on a bicycle? Because 
you know, a lot of people take off on bicycles. You can't take them off the bicycle because it's an elevated position. Uh, they're more at risk. Ted, did you use a lot of tasers or no? Yeah, I think I deployed my taser four times for four different events. All good. It worked really well. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, every single one they locked up. Uh, well, no, one dude was really close. He was throwing punches, and I tried to deploy the taser from like a foot away, and it didn't do anything. Um, and I very seriously considered hitting him in the face with the taser when I was <laughs> mounting him. But at the, you know, here's the weirdest thought that crossed my mind at the time. I was like, if I break this taser on his face, am I going to get in trouble for breaking the taser? <laughs> um, because I was justified to do that. But no, I ended up just using my fist. So good times. I miss some of those things. I miss some of those. Things. So speaking sure. of tasers, there's another viral video going out, which I know you guys have probably seen. Perfect use of a taser. Now, I will use a taser once and I tase the guy right in the tit. But he was <laughs> he was like 350 pounds and like six foot five. I'm like I'm not going to hands on with this right. dude. But so this cops in a gym. I don't know why they don't give any context. But he's standing there in the squat rack with somebody who's like this, right? Like this dude is like I, I'm going to fight this cop. The entire gym's like like just watching about what's going to happen. This cop, you could see, he's contemplating like, do I want to fight this guy? He's fit. He wants to fight me. That's another thing. This guy wants to fight me. Right. I don't particularly want to fight this guy. I want to go eat Chipotle right now. Right. Yeah. So, and you're around a bunch of metal. God, you know, it's, it's like you fall, you're going to hurt yourself. This cop just goes, pop, and pop, days this dude, right? It was perfect. And fall. And then you get the controlled uh, arrest. And it was the most beautiful taser video in the world. You know, let's be honest, though. That could have gone bad. That guy could have fell and hit his head on a on a forty five pound weight that's on the weight holders, and he could have died. So I don't like these people that go back to the the first topic, and they're like, "Oh, well, he." Almost any time you deploy a taser, something bad could happen. So let's just go back to the. I don't know. Don't try to fight a cop in a squat rack. <laughs> <laughs> so Ted, question: They could have had a squat off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, if you can squat, what's a good squat number? Wow, anything over four hundred is impressive to me. Yeah. But Ted, you got some tree trunks for legs. No homo. <laughs> what's what's a good squat number for you, man? Um, I have some arthritis issues in my knee, so my numbers aren't that great anymore. Um, but my best ever was five fifty five for five reps. Oh, with four reps. Nice. <laughs> Maybe I've I've uh, narrowed down some of your knee problems. <laughs> hey, Ted, what's your what's your take yeah. on um, complex exercises as far as a uh, lot of weight? Like people that deadlift and squat a lot of weight, do you suggest that? Because like Brent was saying, with different whatever you read, it's split down the middle. You need to do these to build muscle. Complex exercises are a necessity to build your to build muscle. And then other people are like, you know, people that do it professionally, like professional strongmen, they'll be like, I would not suggest this to anybody because it's destroying my body, but I'm a competitor. Mm. Did you mean compound? Compound. Yes. That's okay. what I meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so compound lifts, I think are great. And I think can be done at virtually any level of athleticism. But yeah, when it comes into like heavyweight, where you're really testing things like your joints and your tendons and your muscle connections. Yeah. You're, you're going to be entering into territory that is leaving practicality at, and benefits for growing muscle. And you're entering a zone in which it's really just for bragging rights <laughs> uh, because for all intents and purposes, you know, you don't need to be able to squat more than 300 pounds, you know, for, for practical purposes, let's say. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say, I think a huge part of why I have arthritis in my knees is because I hit heavy, heavy squats for long sessions and did heavy, heavy weights. And I really did want to be as very big and strong as possible at one point. And I, uh, I do regret it. I mean, personally, like I said, I think some people have the ability to tolerate abuse longer than others. And my form was excellent. My squat form was really good. Um, but I don't think I have the body or genetics to tolerate heavy, heavy weights, uh, for years on end. 
Uh, so yeah, I would say only enter into that territory if for whatever reason you like the idea of being able to say, hey, I can lift X, Y, Z number of weight uh, or you want to enter competitions. Um, but no, like for most intents and purposes and if you just want to be fit and jacked, nobody needs to be lifting 300, 400 pounds on lifts. It's not necessary. Do you still squat? Yeah, I do. But I tend to... I've changed my form a bit to make my knees feel better. Okay. I like to do front squats more so, uh, or for whatever reason with my knees, like the more they travel past my toes, the better they feel. So yeah, I'll do like a lot of goblet squats and front squats and high bar squats, but I used to do low bar squat, like a power lifter. And like I said, I could do 500 pounds for reps. Um, and I got the video in case anyone doubts, <laughs> but, uh, no, not anymore. That's, it's just not worth it to me. Yeah, what 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 weight range are are you? Able, let's say a front squat. What weight range? Uh-huh. You, weight range and, and reps you try to stay in on? Not not heavy. So I would do like one eighty five for yeah. sets of you know like ten. And I just now that I felt the pain of you know arthritis and getting older and and realizing that like lifting super heavy weight and all be all, uh, I've been able to see benefits by controlling my form and my speed. Yeah. Um, like really focusing on the eccentric portion of the rep and feeling that squeeze and that mind muscle connection. Um, and I've met some good bodybuilders who are way strong, way jacked, and they're not putting up huge numbers, but they are doing excellent form. They're pushing to failure and uh, they're getting that squeeze and they're controlling the reps. So yeah, so long answer to your question. I, I For a front squat, I only do like 185 for you know, sets of 10, let's say. Yeah. And I I mean, it kind of what Brent talked about, you're at, when you're doing anything physical, you're, you're at prone to just random injuries. So I don't feel it's smart to like do something that's probably going to multiply that chance of being injured knowingly. Like you're like, okay, well this is gonna, this could like negatively impact my back, you know, like that much, because I remember speaking on like Brent saying, stepping on a rock or stepping on a hole. Isn't there like CC? CC closed circuit surveillance video of you like breaking your ankle in the gym just by like walking. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you're asking me, right? Yeah. Thanks. I can see. Um, so I didn't break anything, but what it was happening is it was my second day at the Academy. I got this great spot. I was going to be, um, part of the Archon team and, uh, doing some other types of training. So we were warming up and I was jump roping on this, on the squishy wrestling mat. And uh, I, I'm not good at jump roping, but I went from one foot to the other and I landed wrong and um, my foot just folded. So the thing is, if you're a first responder and you wear boots all day, actually, you're kind of like leaving yourself somewhat compromised and vulnerable in your ankles because if you, it's almost like a cast, those yeah. boots, right? And, and those muscles that stabilize your foot and help you balance and prevent your foot from folding underneath you. You know, those things atrophy if you're in boots all the time. So like I should have done at the time more things where like I did single leg stuff or like work on balance or even like stand on a, a half BOSU ball and work on those balancing muscles. But yeah, so long story, but uh, I was jump roping, landed on my foot wrong, snapped my ankle. But what's wild is that's a big part of why I started Fit Responder because while I was out on injury, I was laying on the couch all depressed. And I'm um, like, well, I guess I'll just try to like get more clients and, and do more stuff on Instagram. And then I saw like how many people wanted my services and were reaching out. And I was like, whoa, this is what it would be like to do this full time. So that kind of uh, actually snapping my ankle probably was one of the best things that ever happened to me. <laughs> I love, I love that. I, that's a great story. I, I think it's ironic uh, as, and there was a time just like you where I have to as absolute heaviest weights that, that I possibly could and probably for the reason just so I could say that's how much I lifted and I've had a bad back like since my 20s and I I would pull my back a back muscle once every couple of years but it was never doing any heavy weights it'd always be something stupid that I'd yeah. end up pulling a back muscle and I can't explain it dude totally I mean I have a long list of injuries People would expect like, oh, well, you're a guy and you're in the gym a lot, you years of pushing heavy weight. 
most of the times I've been injured is, is injured is doing stupid stuff. Like you said, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like jump roping or like stepping off a curb wrong. Or I did drop a dumbbell on the finger and blasted the end of my pointer finger off. But, uh, yeah, it's usually just doing dumb, dumb, normal stuff. Yeah. And being a cop, I mean, unfortunately you're thrown in all those positions. So you do have to have some kind of weird regiment where you do train on manipulate, like all my injuries were not super crazy stories. They were like, when you're done, like, whew, you're like, my wrist is clicking. It's because <laughs> I, my body wasn't conditioned to be a cop. It still isn't. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but you know, my theory is if you can look the part, you only, you don't have to fight nine people out of 10. But that tenth guy tests you. You better yeah. be ready. You better you better be yeah. a little bit, you know, yeah. conditionally be prepared. Fit. <laughs> yeah. I've I've pulled my back doing stupid things like picking up boxes, moving things, or if it was in the gym, not respecting light weights, like doing one thirty fives squats warming up, but not really paying close attention to my form and and pull a back muscle. Like, are you kidding me? I just squatted 400 three days ago and I pulled a back muscle on 135. But again, just not, not paying attention, not respecting the weights. And it, it got me. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all, um, I think everybody in, at our age, our respective age, Brent's a little older than us, but you know, <laughs> we all kind of narrow in at something that we're inherently good at and we love doing. And I think it takes that long you know, to really fine tune it. And that's the person that you go to when you need advice for something. Like, I'm not talking about general topics, like being a cop, you know, but for instance, like, you know, if you're a street cop, you're not going to go ask, uh, another street cop, a specific question about narcotics. You're going to go ask the cop that does narcotics work all day long. That's all they do. They're going to have the answers for you. And that's why I really wanted to get you on and I really, I wanted to promote you less for you and more for an opportunity for every cop's got an ego. I'll just say it. It's no, and the ones that have huge egos are going to go, no, I don't. So, <laughs> but give them an opportunity to meet you, to see you, to message you and be like, all right, man, you, clearly you are the guru of, of this, such a particular niche of fitness that affects my life. You know, like if you were to go, hey, Tyler, I want to start a podcast. There's no shame in going, can you give me some pointers? Can you, can you, you know, put me on a path, you know, because I'm really good at it as far as like building it. And I didn't think I was ever going to be, but you know, and <laughs> but I'm not really good at anything else, but I can help people with that. So I feel like it's the same thing with a fit responder. I appreciate that, Tyler. And yeah, like I said earlier, I've had a ton of fitness coaches and I've picked up little nuggets from each one of them. Uh, and I think all of us should be humble enough to say, hey, there's something else I could learn and maybe I could benefit from another perspective. Um, so yeah, and that's how I try to approach every client too. Like I might see their situation and their goals and have a general framework I think could help them, but it does take getting to know them on an individual basis to go, Okay, so these are the specific things you need to work on. This is what we should prioritize for efficiency's sake and results' sake. Um, so yeah, I, I think it does take us to be a little bit humble and realize there's something else to learn and, and trust another process. And we all have our own biases. Uh, and it's and in regards to fitness, we love to negotiate with ourselves, right? Like, oh, it's okay if I do X, Y, Z, or that was probably good enough, or I can put this off till tomorrow. Um, so, you know, I think we all can benefit from a little accountability and have a partner in this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's why I started that Patreon uh, group chat about yeah. nutrition and fitness. And that's why I did a midnight workout last night because I said I was going to work out Wednesday and I'm not going to miss it. I did a midnight workout. Did you take pictures? No, I didn't take pictures. <laughs> no, I, I didn't CrossFit. I just did a regular workout, so I didn't take pictures. Well, um, we'll wrap it up now. Brent's going to ask you a question that we never, we never give anybody a heads up. We haven't had anybody go, oh, I was ready for that. They're always kind of like, hmm, question. And I believe there's going to be a softball question for you between your law enforcement and, a, and it may be 
uh, an answer you give off of uh, the, your, your fitness background. We're looking for a funny story for me. Any funny story you got. So like a funny fitness story or a funny first responder story or either one? Either one. Either one. Shooter's I was hoping. I was kind of hoping you'd ask me what the meaning of life is. Me, uh, <laughs> we're we're not that on. deep. We're not that deep. So, you know, sometimes people say like, what's the scariest call you've ever been on? And like, I've responded to calls that like, okay, a hostage being held at gunpoint or a baby choking. And, and those things are scary. But like, actually the scariest call started out as check the well-being of an old woman and it was in a trailer park and my backup's on the way and uh the the door was like open a foot and i'm like hello man hello so i go in and the tv is on and it's like white static and there's like creepy dolls and there's freaking <laughs> cobwebs i swear this was like a horror movie and i was like oh this is so weird so i'm starting to get the heebie-jeebies and then I hear noise in the other room. It sounds like someone talking and it sounds like distress. Like, Ooh. so I'm like, oh man, this is like exigent circumstances, right? So I go in and I'm like, hello, hello. So it's another TV on and it's just like a commercial. So that's the noise I heard. But the old woman's laying in her bed and I'm like, oh, she's dead. Look at her. <laughs> so she's just laying there. It's what old people do. They it's, die. They tend to die eventually. So she's just laying there, eyes closed. I'm like, maybe, I mean, is there a chance she's alive? So I'm like looking at her chest. I don't see rise and fall. I'm like, oh, just in case. So I'm like, man, nothing happens. So I lean closer and I'm like, in mid saying, ma'am, she sits up super fast and screams in my face. She's like, yeah. <laughs> and I freaking scream back because she started the shit out of me. And I was like, ah! and we're both yelling at each other. And she's going, ah, ah. and she's deaf. So, I'm to, <laughs> so I tased her, <laughs> and that's how she died. Uh, so, so I, I'm like screaming. I'm trying to explain to her I'm in there, and she couldn't hear what I'm saying. So she's like, "Who are you? What are you doing here? Help! Help!" And I just backed out of the room like fast as I could, shut the front door. I'm like, <laughs> "Dispatch, I'm 1098. She's all right." You know, I just left. I, I, I just left. I have so many questions that I'm sure you still do. Who made the 911 call? Why is the front door open? Why are two right. TVs on? Well, I think it was a neighbor. Maybe it's like, hey, I usually see Betty, whatever the hell her name is, you know, and I don't say, but yeah, I don't know why the front door was, was open. <laughs> that, that was the most scared, at least in that moment, I've ever been on, <laughs> on the job. Even though I've done things, I think that if I described them, it would sound scarier. Personally, I was super scared in that moment. I've had the same thing same thing neighbor called garage doors open her car is in but she never leaves it open never and we haven't seen her in a couple of days so i'm going i'm like all right you're going you're getting ready to like take the dead person call and <laughs> we go in uh the we check the door inside the garage that enters the house it's open what well, is a check on well-being um the neighbors are insistent that this is not like her we open it up, completely darkness inside. And I'm like, hey, we're down the sheriff's office, nothing. So we decide to go based off of this neighbor's, like, like hey, man, th th this is exigent. Like, I can't ever say that word, exigent. Um, we went in. We did a nice soft search with flashlights announcing ourselves. We went, we checked every bedroom. There's nothing in there. No electricity's running. And then there's a room with a closed door and a rosary around the handle. And I'm like, holy shit. So we go, we open it. And I'm like, oh yeah, she's dead. She's 100% dead. And we can see her laying there. And just like you said, Ted, she goes, ah! And me and my partner are like, ah! <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if anyone listening, they're like, me too, me too. How many of us, many of us have been absolutely scared shitless by some old woman we thought was dead? <laughs> 